So at first it might seem that uh, this paper is utterly unrelated to the two papers that preceded it. Uh, but really this paper, in the, well, in the fact that it, I'm using a monetary model here. But the paper really is about uh, trade and firm dynamics. And I'll see if I can convince you that these things are affected by monetary policy. Uh, this is joint work with Giancarlo Corsetti. So, so the question we're dealing with here is, well, I should say the paper is proposing a, a new or a different way of thinking about how monetary policy affects a country's export competitiveness. Um, and it's different in contrast to the traditional Keynesian perspective in which countries can and historically have used one-off currency depreciations or devaluations in order to improve the price competitive competitiveness of their exports over the short run, over the time span that their prices or wages are sticky. In contrast with that, uh, the th more recent theoretical literature with New Keynesian, using New Keynesian models have uh, focused more on the trade-off between stabilization of the output gap and the goal of improving terms of trade. And when you're talking about improving terms of trade, it, it implies an incentive for uh, monetary authorities to actually try to raise the price of the relative price of their exports because that allows consumers to enjoy a high standard of living with uh, lower labor effort. But when you think about it, that is really quite the opposite sort of thing than what the Keynesian literature had talked about in terms of having lower export prices and enhancing competitiveness. We're talking about here about high export prices. Uh, so this paper is proposing a different way of thinking about the effect of monetary policy on competitiveness in a way that we think better reflects um, the valid concerns about price competitiveness that a lot of policymakers have. And the main idea is that uh, stabilization policy uh, has asymmetric effects across different sectors. If you have multiple traded sectors in the economy, that are heterogeneous from each other in certain key respects, monetary policy will affect them differently. And it can alter the uh, long run comparative advantage of a country between these alternative tradable, tradable goods. So in particular, the distinction among goods that is important for this work is that between differentiated goods, typically identified with manufacturing, and, and non-differentiated goods. Those will be our two tradable sectors. Um, it's very unusual in macroeconomics to have these two distinct sectors, but it's completely normal within the trade literature. And this is just one way in which we are borrowing ideas and modeling techniques from the trade literature to enhance the ability of macro to talk about trade issues. Uh, in, terms, in terms of uh, theoretical models, the distinction here is in terms of market power. We're going to model the differentiated sectors involving monopolistic competition. And empirically, the distinction often used is that differentiated goods lack an organized exchange or published reference price. Uh, hence, they have some, uh, so, so, some, some market power to set prices here. Now, in the monetary literature and the trade literature, uh, differentiated goods typically are associated with two key characteristics uh, that are important for our work. Uh, first, they involve an upfront entry cost. I mean, this is why they are able to have monopoly power, and it's the monopoly profits that are used to pay the entry costs. Um, that's atypical in the macro literature. Uh, but what is more typical in the macro literature is that the differentiated goods with, use the monopoly power to, pre, to, to set prices. That's what gives them price setting power. And it's in that context in which it makes sense to think about price stickiness in terms of prices that are set ahead of time. And that's what gives monetary policy uh, the power to affect real variables. Now it's this pre-commitment of firms, both pre-committing their, their, their entry into a market, an export market, and pre, by paying an entry cost, and uh, pre-committing their price setting that makes these differentiated goods uh, particularly sensitive to uncertainty about future macroeconomic conditions, future macro shocks, the, the demand conditions that they're going to face uh, in the future over which they don't have control. And if monetary stabilization policy can effectively manage this uncertainty about future demand, macroeconomic uncertainty, uh, that can enhance the uh, uh, that can favor these firms and promote entry of these differentiated goods, both in the domestic and export markets. So just to preview the results, we're going to develop a two-country, uh, two-good monetary DSGE model with endogenous comparative advantage uh, over two traded sectors. I'll conduct some uh, quantitative uh, stochastic simulations, uh, which will 
indicates that adopting a peg, that is you're giving up your ability to um, tailor monetary policy to deal with macroeconomic uncertainty, you're giving up independent monetary policy, that will lower the share of your exports that are indifferentiated goods by one to nine percent, which by macroeconomic standards is quite large. If I have time, I'll also talk about some empirical results we have, but just in case I run out of time, uh, we run some panel regressions which show that, again, this, this, this theoretical prediction about pegs, uh, giving up monetary autonomy and uh, discouraging differentiated exports actually does lead to a substantial fall in the share of differentiated goods in your export bundle by 4 to 14 percent, depending on the specification. So that's, those are the takeaways. Uh, let me give you the highlights uh, of the model, and I'll emphasize the parts that are distinctive and important here. Oh, there we go. Okay. One thing I want to highlight is the goods market structure because it's unusual, at least from the perspective of macroeconomic theory. Uh, there will be differentiated goods and non-differentiated goods. Each country produces a range of differentiated goods associated with a particular firm, um, which produces its own variety. Uh, there will be N varieties indexed by H of the differentiated good in the home country and N star varieties of indexed by F in the foreign country. And there will also be country specific that are goods uh, that are non-differentiated. So if you're familiar with macro models, that's the typical bacchus keogh rule business cycle approach. Each country produces a uh, distinctive good. Those will be viewed here as non-differentiated. And in the consumption bundles, there are um, parameterized elasticities between uh, these goods, home for and differentiated, home for and non-differentiated, and uh, we assume Codd-Douglas aggregation between differentiated and non-differentiated. And one thing I'll highlight here is that in this typical uh, bacchus keogh real business cycle aggregation, uh, um, aggregator of home and foreign goods, uh, we will find it convenient at one point to allow this elasticity eta to uh, approach infini infinity, and at that case you've you converge to a situation in which you have a, homo a global homogeneous good, which is a technique that the trade literature uses all the time in order to help get, it, get analytical solutions. And that, again, is something atypical in macro, but is common in trade, which we're gonna make use of here. Okay, what do you need to know about the differentiated goods? Uh, very simple linear production function in labor. There is uh, an aggregate macroeconomic uh, productivity shock affecting all firms equally. We are not modeling productivity heterogeneity in this model. All the firms have the same productivity. Turns out not to be important, to think, for the issues we're looking at. All these firms have to pay a sunk entry cost one period ahead in order to enter, um, uh, in order to come, in order to, to begin production, um, which either can be in units of labor or goods. Firms have to preset their prices subject to an adjustment cost in uh, a style referred to as the uh, developed by Rotenberg, um, a real cost of adjusting your price, and they also face a trade cost if they export an iceberg trade cost. Uh, firms have a decision of whether to enter uh, production or not, and that entry decision depends upon the firm value, which is the present discounted stream of discounted future profits, which depend both upon domestic and export sales minus the co uh, production costs and price setting costs. And the entry condition is that you're equating the firm value to the uh, value of the sunk entry cost. Uh, this is the price setting behavior. I don't really need to em uh, emphasize all of the details here other than to say that there's uh, an incentive here to adjust your prices slowly. So we have price stickiness. I don't think I need to say anything about the non-differentiated goods sector. It's entirely standard, linear in labor. Households uh, are maximizing a uh, discounted utility over, uh, of consumption, uh, money in the utility, and uh, leisure with a standard uh, first order conditions. Okay. Now for analytical results, we can actually uh, get fairly far if we simplify the model in a couple of key ways. Uh, one simplification is uh, that we'll reduce the dynamics to just one period. So assume firms just preset their price one period rather than having a complicated dynamic structure of adjustment. So preset one, one period ahead. Suppose that they have to pay their entry cost one period ahead every period. So that is their entry, paying the entry cost gets you permission to produce the next period and then you have 100% appreciation of that entry capital. Uh, and 
also assume that this elasticity of substitution between the home and foreign good uh, um, um, approaches infinity, then you have the, you, you're, you're converging to a case in which you have this homogeneous global good, uh, which is typical in the trade literature. Under these assumptions, we can actually solve for the number of firms, uh, output, and a number of other things. Uh, a key idea here, though, you, uh, the key driving mechanism, you can see what's going on by looking at the price setting function in this case. Prices are set as a markup over the cost, wage divided by productivity. In expectation, because you're setting these things ahead of time. But there's another term involved in price setting here because the expectations actually include uh, the discounting and the uh, level of demand in the future that you expect to face, given that uh, production is demand determined once your price has been set. So this can be rewritten as uh, some of two terms, one of which involves a covariance, the covariance between the demand in the future and the marginal costs under which you're producing. So that if you are in the unfortunate situation in which your marginal costs are high at the same, the same time the demand is high, you're being forced to produce at the times that you don't want to produce, you don't like that situation, it's analogous to a risk premium that leads you to a higher price that firms will choose to set in order to hedge against that uncertainty. So there's an extra, an extra markup. However, if you have a beneficent mon and, and, and uh, uh, intelligent monetary authority uh, that can adjust um, monetary policy to affect the level of demand given preset prices, this demand term can be manipulated in order to move uh, uh, in the opposite direction of costs so that the times when costs are high, that's when demand will be low. When costs are low, demand is high. That means that this term will be negative and it leads to a lower markup. So the prices that firms set are affected by this covariance, which is affected by monetary policy. And when you're looking at the comparative advantage of this country in terms of these differentiated goods, what you care about is the price set for the differentiated goods relative to the non-differentiated goods, which is just flexible prices, relative to that, relative to what's going on in the foreign country. So if the countries are asymmetric in their ability to manipulate this covariance, you're going to affect the relative relative prices and hence comparative advantage, what good this, this country is going to produce. So in particular, if the home country um, um, increases demand during times of uh, beneficial productivity shocks, firms will set lower prices on average, which in steady state in the long run enhances the comparative advantage of this country in differentiated goods. They will tend to produce and export differentiated goods, and the foreign country will do the opposite if they have uh, a less beneficial monetary policy. In addition, this is going to lead to firm dynamics in which firms will tend to enter more in the market that has the better monetary policy, both because of the larger domestic market and because it affects the uh, value of the sunk entry cost. And this home market effect will amplify all of these effects on comparative advantage in production. You, uh, you could solve for optimal, optimal monetary policy under the simplifying assumptions we make, inflation targeting of, of the differentiated goods export prices we so far, appear, well, according to our, our simulations, is, is, appears to be a, 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 a local optimum. Yeah, so under certain assumptions that we're making here, it will be the optimum monetary policy just to stabilize inflation of these differentiated goods. Okay. Uh, I, I will, regarding calibration, I'm only going to mention the things that are different from the usual real business cycle literature. Uh, there are data uh, available on, on um, uh, differentiated and non-differentiated goods in terms of what share of exports they are. There's some data on el various elasticities. Uh, and so we will borrow uh, some numbers from earlier literature implying a much higher elasticity for the um, for non-differentiated goods and a lower elasticity for the differentiated goods. There's also a higher trade cost associ associated with the differentiated goods. That's not a transportation cost. It's more of a matching cost, language cost. That is, you have a differentiated goods that other people don't know about that you need to let other people know. You need to match with a potential buyer. And that's not true if you have a non-differentiated good, uh, which you can trade in an organized exchange or just based upon a published reference price. Okay, uh, we uh, uh, found data on um, 
output and productivities in these different sectors. We use that to calibrate shocks. And then we run some stochastic simulations where we have shocks, this product, we have these four productivity shocks in each country hitting each period over a horizon of time. We then look at what is the average level of all the endogenous variables, an unconditional mean in this stochastic environment. So we're taking into consideration all the second moments, such as the covariance in the price setting and all the implications that has for comparative advantage, production, and exporting. So these are unconditional means in a stochastic environment. The first two variables here indicate the number of firms in the differentiated sector. The first simulation assumes that both countries uh, uh, pursue inflation stabilization. They're basically matching productivity shocks, um, countering productivity shocks. The second two uh, variables refer to the share of differ, uh, differentiated goods in exports. And you see symmetry here when the policies are symmetric. There's slight asymmetry because the calibration of the shocks are not perfectly symmetric in the, in the actual data matching U.S. versus a European aggregate. The second experiment we do is suppose the foreign country has a fixed exchange rate and therefore is not, st uh, not, not uh, targeting inflation and hence not countering the productivity shocks in the optimal way. What you see is that the share of differentiated goods in the foreign country now is lower than that in the home country. Which we, if we compare this column to that common, there's a percentage change fall in the share of differentiated goods in the foreign country, its exports, and a offsetting corresponding rise in the share of home countries' differentiated goods in their total export bundle. The comparative advantage has shifted. That's reflected also in the number of firms in the differentiated sector. There's a fall in the number of firms in that sector in the foreign country and a rise in the home country. This is reflected also in the production, both of differentiated goods and non-differentiated goods. Uh, one reason we're getting larger effects than you typically get in a macro model is that it's not just is the fact we have two countries uh, where one country can, um, where the global aggregate may not change much, but one country can change a lot in a way that's offset uh, by what's going on in the foreign country. And that's because it's all comparative advantage that's driving things. And lastly, I just want to uh, highlight this price mechanism. If you look at the relative price in the foreign country of the differentiated goods and not differentiated, it's gone up. And that's why uh, they've lost comparative advantage. And the last thing I want to emphasize is if you compute the terms of trade, that is the relative price of home country exports to foreign country exports, that's been a focus of the new Keynesian literature. You're supposed to try to improve terms of trade. Our model is saying, no, it's actually optimal to try to lower the price of your differentiated goods exports in order to gain market share or comparative advantage in that sector. Well, it turns out that the terms of trade in our model for the home country is actually improving the way the new Keynes literature says it should. How do you reconcile these two things? Well, we think the terms of trade actually is a composite both of non-differentiated exports and differentiated exports. Typically, the trade literature only looks at the differentiated goods really think it should include both. And what's happening here is that you are shifting the weight of differentiated goods in your export bundle. And these goods, because they're monopolistic, competitive, half markups, they have a higher price than the non-differentiated exports. So by shifting your exports towards that higher value export, by lowering your relative price in that sector, which overall has higher prices in the other sector, but you're lowering your relative price compared to the foreign country in that sector, uh, you're actually raising the average price of your exports overall and improving your terms of trade. So these things are not incompatible with each other. Um, so that's the, uh, the summary of the, uh, the main result of the benchmark models here in the first column where I'm just pre presenting the percent changes between the symmetric policy and the asymmetric policy with the foreign country pegs. And I'll summarize all of that in the, uh, with the thing here in the yellow, which is adding together the effects on differentiated share for, the bo for both countries. So about a 1% change in relative export shares between the two countries. Um, we have a number of different cases, different calibrations that we look at. One is where we shut off the endogenous entry and say that there's a fixed number of firms in each, in each country. This is something not typically considered in the macro literature, this firm dynamics. It turns out firm dynamics are absolutely essential to this quantitative result. If you shut that down, 
you lose almost all of the result. It's the choice of firms where to locate that makes the big difference here. What type of price stickiness you has, have has a small effect. Whether you have sticky wages or not actually does help us, and the reason is that when the domestic country is expanding the monetary <coughs> policy to stimulate demand during a positive productivity shock, it's actually affecting, uh, it's driving up wages at the same time if they're flexible and driving up costs of production, which offsets the result in the benchmark model. However, if you have sticky wages to close off that negative feedback effect, you get a bigger, uh, the original effect uh, um, in that covariance is more prominent and you get a bigger effect on the relative different, the relative export share. And just to uh, um, jump to the maximum case, if you, um, if you completely shut down this endogenous response in wages by adopting preferences in which you close down the wealth effect on labor supply, as well as having a high labor elasticity, you can actually get quite a big effect. Uh, you could affect the differentiated export share between the two countries by, uh, by over 9%, which by macroeconomic standards is really very big. Okay. We also look at other shocks, but I don't need to talk about that. Okay. So I have a few minutes um, to talk about some empirical work what we're trying to do to, to, to support this theoretical conclusion. So remember, the main prediction from the theory is that if your monetary policy is constrained, say, by a peg, which is a classic case that you see in the real world, um, all else equal, that will reduce your, the export specialization in differentiated goods. So our empirical strategy is to collect data on export shares and regress it on whether a country pegs or not in, uh, in a panel and see what effect the policy has. We're able to we construct a share of differentiated goods based upon trade to data from the Feenstra data set along with the classification of these four-digit industries into di uh, differentiated and non-differentiated based upon um, a, a classification by route, indicating whether they have a reference price or organized exchange. So here's the regression. We will regress the share of differentiated goods on the PEG status. We have a couple of different ways of measuring uh, de facto or de jure status as a, as a country with a PEG, and they have a number of other controls that were included including, and the question is, is this beta negative or not? Does having a peg reduce your share of exports? Um, yellow box says yes, it does. Significant and with a fairly large coefficient of around almost 6%. Now, our first thought was maybe this result is being driven by uh, the fact that countries that are endowed with commodities and export commodities, many of which are invoiced in the world market in dollars, find it convenient to peg in dollars. So maybe that's why there's an association between um, PEG and not exporting differentiated goods. However, when we control for, when we take out all the oil exporting countries, we still get the same result. When we take out uh, various income levels, uh, we, we take out countries that export uh, oil, we take out uh, all energy exports about, by any country, uh, we still get the same result. Uh, we try different measures of PEG, we get the same result, and also when we try the two standard ways of controlling for endogeneity, um, two, two classic ways of doing that, uh, trying to control for the endogeneity of pegging status, we still get the same result. Now, it's still impossible to know if, if there's still some endogeneity in here in which the choice of a country to peg or not um, is influenced by what types of goods they export rather than the pegging status determining your comparative advantage uh, but this, we're, doing, we're, we're trying to take out that endogenous the best we can, and uh, uh, it, there seems to be a, a surprisingly large effect uh, that, that, that's present in the data. So how about the capital say, if um, job those countries, so the capital account, does this survive? So, so, close, so the question is about closed capital accounts, so unbalanced capital. trade. Uh, so capital controls. Right. Yeah, so, um, um, so the question is if you have capital controls, that allows you to have, in principle, independent monetary policy even though you, um, you have a peg. Uh, the way we're measuring, yeah, so the, the, I should say the, 
this alternative way of measuring PEG is a de facto measure asking to what degree do you actually have independent control of your monetary policy. Measure in terms of do you adjust your interest rate in response to the exchange rate to keep it constant, right? Uh, so for example, in China is in this data set. And for many of the years here, China is classified as having as not having a PEG under, under, this, under this metric. And we still get the same result. Uh, so the conclusion is that uh, the conduct of monetary policy, uh, we want to argue, uh, is a contributor we're thinking about uh, to a country's comparative advantage that we could add to the list of all the classic things that determine comparative advantage. Uh, and it suggests a, a sharply contrasting uh, alternative to the existing new Keynesian approach, which says we should focus on improving terms of trade. Um, which that, that approach, we, we think, really has very little to say about actual policy makers who seem to be much more concerned about should, what should we do to improve our, our export competitiveness. Uh, this is a model that uh, says that those two things actually are not inconsistent with each other uh, and that we should think about state, basically the main lesson is that the types of stabilization policy we think of from a macro perspective as being optimal for stabilizing the output gap are also optimal from the perspective of enhancing your comparative advantage because they create a favorable environment for the investment in entry by differentiated goods, which might be beneficial to you, either in terms of the value of the goods they're producing or the fact that it allows you to produce domestically goods that typically have higher trade costs. Um, yeah, so we think that this approach has, has uh, working for it a greater relevance for the types of concerns for competitiveness that policymakers seem to, to be talking about. Uh, one minute if there are any questions from the floor. If not, uh, we can end one minute early. Okay, very good. So let's uh, thank all the speakers.